Hello, good evening. So today I'll be answering a question about the Satipatthana Sutta. It's the discourse on mindfulness. In the Satipatthana Sutta, it's broken up into sections. And at the end of each section, there's a uh, there's a repeated phrase. And the Buddha says several very important things. It's important that we don't gloss over or you know, we don't skip over what the Buddha says about uh, the practice of mindfulness at the end of each section. So we have the four foundations of mindfulness, body, feelings, mind, dhamma, kaya, vedana, citta, dhamma. And then uh, kaya and uh, dhamma are split up into, into sections. And one part of the ending of each, of each section says that yeah, well, the beginning actually, where it says iti tangva kaya kaya nupasi and so on. Ajatang means internally. Thus, one is mindful internally. And then he says bahidawa or externally. And then he says internally or externally, or internally and externally. Uh, and so the question came, and it's been asked before, what is meant by internally and externally? How do you be mindful of something internally and how do you be mindful of something externally? What's the difference? Most puzzling is how you would be mindful of something externally. Based on our practice, um, it's very much internal. You know, based on most people's understanding of meditation, it's the inner way, the inward path. So the idea that you could somehow meditate on something outside of yourself, uh, or be mindful at least of something outside of yourself, is a bit confusing. So I can give three possible answers to how one can practice external, external mindfulness. And this is based a little bit on the commentaries, a little bit on um, different suttas, and a little bit on my own understanding of the Buddha's teaching. Uh, the first way that one can practice mindfulness externally is in the practice of vipassana. The second way someone can practice mindfulness of something externally is in the practice of samatha. And the third way that one can practice uh, mindfulness of something that is externally is, sorry, in the practice of vipassana. The first one, in preparation for vipassana is what I meant. So in preparation for vipassana, in the practice of samatha, or you could even say in, in preliminary practice of samatha, and in the actual practice of vipassana. So I'll explain how this works. In, the, in preparation for the practice of vipassana, or in conjunction, what I meant by in the practice of samatha, is in the practice of vipassana is uh, as a support for one's practice of vipassana. And this is what the sub-commentary actually says about this. It makes a note that actually this, this external idea isn't actually meditation at all. Or it says it, it can't lead to tranquility of mind. It can't lead to the focus and concentration that's needed to develop insight. But it's something that's useful in insight in a way that a lot of things are in the suttas and just in the practical reality uh, along our path to enlightenment. So we have to differentiate between what is meditation and what is not meditation in, in regards, in this regards. And the sub, based on the sub-commentary's sub explanation, there's this idea that our reflections on 
external realities can often be quite valuable in our own practice of mindfulness. Even though it's not mindfulness in the same way, it's mindfulness in a way that allows us to understand and appreciate reality better and more clearly. So when you focus on someone else's body, you can focus on, and each section has this, so you can focus on their breath, you can focus on their uh, postures when they're walking, so watch someone else walking, they're walking, walking. Uh, and you can focus on, of course, say a dead body or someone else's uh, parts of, the, of someone else's body, their hair and their nails and their teeth and their skin and so on. And some of this might sound quite weird, like why would you focus on someone else's breathing? Why would you focus on someone else's walking? My idea in regards to this is that given that each the end of each section is the same for each section, and yet each section is a different sort of practice, that in some ways one wants to say that The, the the words are only meant to describe, and, and they do this quite well, to describe the general idea of how one is mindful. And so at the end of each section he says, uh, one, one is mindful externally, internally, one sees the beginning, the arising and the ceasing of things. Um, one sees that there is just the body, there is just the feelings, they are what they are. And so it describes how one is mindful, but it may very well be that some sections are much more useful when practiced externally. And that's granted that it's a good point that some of them, some of the objects of meditation are internal, which is mostly what we do, of course. Walking, walking. It, it really only makes sense if you're paying attention to your own movement because you can't feel someone else's walking. With the breath, well, there are different kinds of breath meditation. With our breath meditation, it doesn't make sense that you should focus on someone else's rising and falling because you won't actually experience rising and falling. You won't experience the tension, you won't experience the flaccidity. But in regarding a corpse, which is a part of the sutta, it can be quite useful. Useful, let's say, for vipassana. Because if you're looking at someone else's you know, dead body and... and uh, bloated body and then the flesh being rotted, maggots coming out of it. Don't say that that's just a concept. That's quite powerful as a reflection. It sets a, a very good tone for your own practice. It leads to revulsion, makes you realize that actually this body is just like that. Hey, there's bones in this body as well and so on. And even m mindfulness of the parts of the body if you look at someone else, suppose there's someone who you're very much attracted to. You can focus on their hair, and you think, oh, their hair is quite beautiful, or quite handsome. But then you study their hair in, in, in a Buddhist way, and you think, oh yes, this hair of theirs is planted like rice in their scalp, which is not, not just mud and water. No, in the scalp there's blood, and there's oil, and there's uh, flakes of skin, and so on. And the hair doesn't smell like rice does. No, the hair smells like body. It smells putrid after some time. The nails, they turn yellow, they get dirt and skin and particles and all sorts of stuff underneath them. They get chipped and broken and so on. So you look at someone's beautiful nails and then you think about their nails in a different way. It can be very useful not just for samatha meditation, but also for vipassana meditation. It's not vipassana. It's, it's not mindfulness in the way that we narrowly understand it. But there's a mindfulness there. You're, you're, you're contemplating, you're reflecting in a way that's going to be quite useful. And, and this is important to understand because our practice cannot be myopic in the, in the way of just... Um, you know, just dasana pahataba, just focusing on vipassana, seeing clearly. We have to also be aware of things in our life and re and relate to things in our lives and and reflect. 
we have to make a clear delineation between actual mindfulness practice and mindful reflection you know, where you say uh, this, before long this body will lie on the earth just like that body there now, that's a reflection it's not actually being mindful of you know, arising and ceasing phenomena but it's an external reflection focusing on the body and seeing the body dead focusing on the body and seeing it um, ugly and so on these things can be a great support for vipassana meditation and can actually be a real catalyst for true insight there are cases in in the suttas of uh, there's a case of a monk who saw a woman walking down the street but he had been so fixed on the contemplation of bones that all he saw was her teeth when she smiled when she laughed and when he saw her teeth she he just saw her he reflected and it, he went absorbed into that and saw this woman as just a, a sack of bones walking down the street and she walked past him and he kept walking on arms around and a man came and he said hey have you seen my wife he was chasing after her for some reason and uh, he says oh I, I just saw a, a bag of bones or I just saw a, a pile of bones you know what he said because that's all he actually saw and this is this monk when he when, when that happened he became enlightened just by seeing the woman's teeth. Some people might say, how is it possible, that, I've been asked this several times, how is it possible that just seeing his, this woman's teeth he became enlightened? Now it's not directly possible that that should be enlightened, an enlightening experience, but it's the reflection. It sets you, it, it, it sets you in the mode, mood, potentially perfect mood of seeing things just as they are. You know, just just the last straw that you needed to see clearly. So we have to separate between meditation and not meditation, but we also have to see that many times there's going to be some interaction with our non-meditative uh, qualities. The, the, the commentary, the sub-commentary, seems to be saying that it's it's for the purpose of supporting insight but external can very much be a support or a preliminary for re for samatha meditation it, it it often quite often is in classical samatha meditation you would focus on an external object like a disc or something in the satipatthana sutta you would be mindful of a dead body for the purpose of gaining this this fixed concentration on the idea of of the dead body you would focus on one of the uh, parts of the body and you would come to see, be absorbed in that hair or teeth or so on and it could be an object of meditation that would lead to tranquility but the third way that this external idea of external practice could uh, could be thought of as could be understood is in the actual practice of insight meditation and what I mean by this is externally and internally if you're going to look at the arising and ceasing of things then it has to be based on experience and so this is the clue because externally and internally as we normally think of them have nothing to do with experience they have to do with entities and so understanding the difference between entities and, and, and experiences is important. So it's important to understand how this can be a practice of, of true mindfulness. See, external entities, you have you know, people and places and things, and you see them. You see the person walking. You know, even if you think of it just as walking, it's a thing. And it's not actually an experience of walking, it's an experience of seeing. So if you talk about something external, it's an experience of seeing, it's an experience of conceiving. But in every experience, there is, to, uh, in, in, in one way, there is an external and an internal. And that is in regards to the senses. So our practice of mindfulness involves external stimuli 
and internal sense bases and the contact between those two. You, know, you don't see anything unless there's light touching the eye. You don't hear anything unless there's sound touching the ear. And so the sound is external. The light is external. And these are, you know, it seems quite simple, but it describes a framework that is unlike how we normally perceive reality. Our normal perception of reality is people, places, and things. So understanding and looking at reality in terms of sights and the eye, sounds and the ear, smells and the nose, tastes and the tongue, feelings and the body, and thoughts and the mind. It's something that the Buddha taught again and again and again, quite often. It's one of the most often taught teachings on the six senses, internal and external. And they're actually called that. There's the uh, internal sense, sense bases and the external sense objects. And so there's, um, there, there, there's a pair of them. And so sometimes, and this is really very close to what the, the language of the Satipatthana Sutta, sometimes one sees the, the object and the, the light touching the eye, experiences that. Sometimes someone is aware of, of it from internally, of the eye seeing. Right? It's just a perspective. Uh, same with the, so sometimes someone is aware of the fact that the ear is receiving the sound, sometimes oh, sees it more as the sound that touches the ear. But understanding and seeing reality in terms of this framework you know, it gets you so much closer to what's really happening. It gets you to a state of, of existence, a state of being, a state of interaction with the world that is perfect, that is clear, that is free from any kind of judgment, partiality, or, or ignorance. You know, it brings us closer to reality, brings us closer to what's really going on. Because our idea of seeing someone, seeing something, is an abstraction. It's based first on the light touching the eye, and second, on the processing of it. And it leads third to the judgment and so on. Because experience is momentary, our sights and sounds and smells, they, they come and they go. And because they are uh, simple, they are basic, they are, they are fundamental building blocks, there's no possibility, there's no potential for clinging to them. When you're aware, when you're, when you're observing from the point of view of light touching the eye, there's no room for any attachment. And so this is, I think, the best way. It may not be what the Buddha actually meant when, when he said, or, or what, what the, the words in, in each of these sections actually means, this specific teaching. But it is a good opportunity for us to look at in, in vipassana meditation based on the four foundations of mindfulness to look at how we perceive reality how reality um, presents itself to us and that is through these six senses so when we say to ourselves seeing, seeing there's actually three things there's the light, there's the eye and there's the consciousness because even if there's light touching the eye, if your mind is somewhere else, you can't see. Even when there's sound touching the ear, when there's you know, sound waves touching the ear, sometimes you're so focused you don't even hear someone when they call you. Quite often we don't notice smells and tastes and feelings until they become unpleasant and then we realize when they become acute. So in reality there are these three things and together they, they, there's this contact. And the Buddha talked about these again and again. And quite clear that all he was trying to do was describe reality so that we could know it when we saw it. And so that we could change the way we look at things. Like if someone looking at your car, for example, and they want to show you, they want to point out what's wrong with it so you can fix it. 
you know, to show you the a new way of looking at things. You know. The way we look at things is problematic. It's um, imprecise. So it's not that seeing people and places and things is wrong. It's just that it's unable to provide the clarity that we need to change. You know, if we, if and when we become free from all wrongness, all imperfections in our mind, all bad habits, then we, we would be fine to focus on abstract entities. But because they're abstract, they, give, they leave room for misunderstanding. And when we have misunderstanding, this is where it gives rise to bad habits, bad ideas. So describing and illustrating and laying out all of the building blocks of reality and how the mind interacts with them in terms of the six senses internally and externally is a very good example. This allows us to become closer to reality. So there you go. There's three ways you could understand it. One, it's useful to, fo to reflect on external things. Two, you take the external object as a basis for, for tranquility. And three, it has nothing to do with external objects at all. It has to do with external aspects of experience. And that may very well be what the Buddha is referring to here. Either way, all three are valid. And that's an answer to the question. So thank you for listening. I wish you all the best.